is a, a nice, intimate crowd. This is great. Um, so, hey, everybody. Hey. My name is Mikey, oh. and um, this is this is a fun a fun talk for me actually to be kind of doing a similar version of it a second time um, because um, this is really for me more like a it's like a a chance for me to kind of geek out a little bit. Um, usually my talks are in slightly different venues. Either I'm trying to give sort of a grand sort of philosophical vision or convince tech people or do, you know, something like that. And, um, but, but this convergence of art and science and technology is really at my core. And I never really get to talk from that place. And so the, the talk tonight is really kind of me um, telling you about some of the stuff I'm working on in the area of technology and human connection and um, going through some projects and hopefully sharing some of my, some of my excitement. So first, a little bit of background. Um, my graduate work is in the area of robotics, actually a, a sort of a sub area called social robotics. And what it was looking at is the way that, um, that these social interfaces can influence human beings. And my specific research was actually in this area that I called persuasive robotics. And it was really looking deep at how um, robots can affect human belief, um, behavior, behavior um, decision making, a, a whole bunch of different factors. Um, and throughout that research, uh, and, and after when I finished, this question kept sort of nagging me. And it was this question of why. What, what is the point of this? If you can create a, a technology that is incredibly influential, um, why? For what purpose? To what end? Um, and so my focus has, in a way, kind of in retrospect I've seen, sort of evolved out of that question. And I've become really interested in, um, I guess you could say, what is the ultimate potential positive impact that technology can have on human beings? Um, what is the greatest positive effect on the human experience that we can imagine? And for me, my interest in technology is in a way similar to um, the focus of positive psychology, or on the other side to um, contemplative traditions like Buddhism or, or other Eastern traditions. And it's really about um, thinking about maximizing human potential. Um, maybe you could call it uh, enlightenment engineering. And, um, and I've done a lot of work in this space and explored different avenues from founding uh, conferences. I teach at Stanford on these topics. Um, I've developed different technologies, uh, geeked out in, in all kinds of ways. But what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is one particular focus, which is really the part that I'm particularly excited about, which is the interpersonal aspect of this. Um, we are social animals. So much of um, who we are and what we are and our experience day to day and moment to moment is in the we space. It's in the interconnected space. Um, and our sense of well-being, as research continues to show, is um, deeply influenced by our relationships. And so my interest um, is increasingly around how technology can support that space. Um, and so I kind of want to give a framing for this. Um, so technology is already playing a huge part in how human beings connect to each other. So in a way, we're, we're much more connected now than we've ever been. Um, there's over 2.3 billion people on social networks worldwide. Um, but Interestingly, um, the AARP estimates that we're somewhere between two and four times lonelier than we were 50 years ago. So um, something is missing. And actually, um, Vivek Murthy, who um, was the US Surgeon General up until 2017, is really passionate about this topic. And um, I'm going to quote him. He says, the world is suffering from an epidemic of loneliness. If we cannot rebuild strong, authentic social connections, we will continue to splinter apart in the workplace and in society. Instead of coming together to take on the great challenges before us, we will retreat to our corners, angry, sick, and alone. 
We must take action now to build the connections that are the foundation of strong companies and strong communities, and that ensure greater health and well-being for all of us. And, um, and so the thing that I've learned from observing the tech space is in connection, it's not the quantity of connection that matters, but the quality of connection. And this is what research um, continues to show. So there's a researcher named George Valiant who, um, who uh, started a longitudinal study um, in, around human well-being and development. And it's um, one of the longest running and, and most significant longitudinal studies on that topic. It's called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. And um, he, after uh, about 70 years of looking at this data, he summarized those findings. And his summary of the findings was pretty simple. He said, the warmth of relationships throughout life have the greatest positive impact on life satisfaction. And in short, he says, happiness is love, full stop. So recognizing the profound importance of human connection, not just as sort of the icing on the cake of our human experience, but actually really something that is vital for our health and well-being, for our sanity. Um, and looking at the way that technology is not enabling that depth of connection. My interest, my curiosity, my exploration is how can in this continually changing, evolving world, an accelerating world that we live in where technology is increasingly ubiquitous, how do we ensure that this depth of connection is still provided for, is still supported? And how can technology be a force that works to support that connection rather than something that we need to cope with or fight against in order to find that connection? Right? Um, so what I'm going to go through are um, three different projects and this kind of shows you my own personal evolution in how I think about um, this problem and how I've sort of played around and tried to solve it in different ways. And I'm going to give away the ending, I've by no means solved this problem and I have not discovered sort of the holy grail of you know, technological human connection but um, I have uh, discovered some very interesting things. And I, to sharing them with you. So, HeartSync is um, one of my earlier projects, and it's um, based on um, some research that looks at um, the way that people's respiration and heart rate variability um, synchronize when they're near each other. And specifically, um, there was a great research paper, and this has been shown in other research as well, which took uh, two people that are in a romantic relationship sat, that de sat them down next to each other and no words are exchanged, no information is, just, is exchanged between them but just by being next to each other um, their respiration naturally synchronizes and the change in heart rate over time, their heart rate variability also naturally synchronizes and for those of you that have a, a partner you might have noticed if you wake up in the middle of the night if you're sleeping together you're breathing is synced. Has anyone ever noticed that? Anyone? Okay, pay attention. But um, this doesn't happen with people who are not in a relationship? It tends to not happen with people that don't know each other. If you're just a random person sitting next to each other, you're probably not going to have that happen. So there's something about rapport, there's something about the depth and quality of connection that seems to correspond to this synchronization, right? And by the way, there are lots of other ways that our bodies synchronized from something called pupillary contagion, where our pupils actually dilate in correspondence to each other, um, to um, physical movements and body postures, to um, stride, the way that we walk and the pace of steps. So it kind of makes sense, right? It's kind of this idea of being in sync, but there are correlates that show up in the brain and in the body. Um, and so the idea here is how do you reverse engineer this? How do you create a system, essentially a feedback loop, that can take a group of people that are out of sync, whoops, and this is what it looks like when people are out of sync, um, and how can you bring them into this state, and this is actual data from the project, um, where you can see these nice sinusoids, 
This is the change in heart rate, a heart rate going up, heart rate going down, and you can see how all of these are both phase and frequency uh, matched. Um, and so I'm going to show you how this system works um, with a nice. Uh, so that, just question. Yes. <coughs> yes. It's not the absolute synchronization that your heart beats at the same time. Yeah. It's just that the rate goes faster or slower in synchronization. Exactly. Okay. Um, it's um, the actual timing of your heartbeat um, is really tied to your physiology. So it wouldn't make as much sense for people's heartbeats to beat at exactly the same time, and you don't you don't tend to see that um, in terms of synchrony between people. Um, even respiration between people that are really different size is much harder to find. Um, so this video kind of. Uh, you a sense of the project, and I'm going to sort of talk over it because the a little cheesy the sound. The sound doubles the cheesiness. Um, so the way the way the project works is um, you have uh, these. Uh, so the project can accommodate up to six people at a time, um, and you have these sensors that measure pulse through the ear, and um, that data is analyzed by a computer looking for patterns of heart rate variability. And this, in this case, this red um, uh, shape in the middle um, is a representation of this person's heart rate variability. And the more sinusoidal it becomes, the more rhythmic it becomes, the more this shape expands. Um, this white line is a external breath guide to synchronize the breathing. Um, here comes the second person. Um, and so you're going to see uh, more shapes show up. And so what happens is um, by looking at these patterns, it creates it's essentially classic biofeedback. It creates a feedback loop. And what you see here, this sort of you know group of white lights coming together, this is what happens when the group gets into a state of synchrony. And then people automatically fall in love. It's um, immediate. So, um, so of course, um, so for any um, for any good project, you have to. Oh, You have to have your obligatory Burning Man experience. Um, and this is what the project looks like now. So this is in the Tech Museum in San Jose. So um, you have a lot of 13-year-olds, 12-year-olds that get bussed in. And for many of them, this is their first introduction to actually paying attention to their own breathing. And it's structured sort of like a game, where in a way they're sort of competing to get synchronized. But it's a funny game because um, the only way to win the game is by actually paying attention to your breath, calming your breathing, and getting into a rhythmic breathing state. So it's a way of teaching these kids meditation and sort of group collective meditation um, in a way that sort of looks like technology and looks like fun. Um, and so I'm going to kind of introduce uh, an idea here as sort of an interlude. So um, this previous project that I showed you is based on a very particular premise. And it's what I would call um, bias feedback, where in this context what I'm calling bias is the degree to which a system is driving toward a predefined goal state. So in this case, we had this known correlate that we were shooting for. right? We said, OK, this is what it looks like in terms of uh, the heart rate variability pattern when people are connected. And so what we're going to try and do is drive people to that state by essentially giving them feedback on how close or far away they are. Right? Now, that works. It's actually been done tons of time. It still continues to be done in, in um, all kinds of neurofeedback and biofeedback research that's happening. 
Um, but there's some problems associated with it. There's actually a term called biofeedback induced anxiety, right? Because all of a sudden you're using this thing and you're looking up at the screen and you're like the red guy and then you look over at the yellow one and it's way bigger and you're like, oh man, that guy over there is way more zen out than I am and then you get uncomfortable and then you start judging yourself and it sort of defeats the whole purpose of creating a tool for well-being and relaxation, right? Um, and so what I've begun to explore is this other idea uh, called unbiased feedback. It's a way of actually creating real-time feedback, but without any sort of goal state. And I'll describe in more detail what that looks like. Do I have a clock, by the way? Or do you have a camera? Yeah, I have this. You have five minutes. Oh, wow. OK. Um, so this project is called Connectome. And it's very different in nature. The idea here is um, you have a um, computer-controlled uh, lighting. Um, and you have these subpacks that are personal subwoofers that are connected to a device that measures respiration and a device that measures pulse. And the way, yeah, let's just do this. The way that it works is that each person can actually see and hear the other person's um, breath as sound and light in the space. And each person can actually feel the other person's heartbeat vibrating their body through a personal subwoofer. And in this system, there's no points, there's no goal state that you're trying to drive to. What it really is more is a kind of a technology-assisted self-awareness, where um, the internal state is brought externally. And it's a way to um, connect with that person at a basic <coughs> sensory level um, uh, without actually optimizing for anything specifically. Um, and I, there's a video, I'm going to skip it because I've got more stuff to come, but of course, we had to kind of take this to Burning Man because it's required. Um, and, and I'm going to skip ahead to the most current project. So this is called uh, the Group Flow Project. And this is really an attempt to kind of take this idea to the next level. And um, this is at a different scale than the other projects I've been working on. This is really more of a research, science and research um, platform. And this is, gives you just a sense of like what the system looks like. This is actually at an earlier, even more kind of rat's nest kind of stage. But um, these are some of our collaborators. This is Anil Chima, who founded the Wellness Education at Stanford. Um, and this is Matt Wright, um, who's the technical director at uh, Karma, Stanford's computer music program. Um, and what this is, is um, a, a pretty complex technology platform um, that has a bunch of inputs and outputs um, and the capacity to create a whole slew of different forms of interactions. And I'm going to kind of dive into that. So the basic setup is we have um, a bunch of uh, sensors and lights that you can see kind of distributed around the room. Um, we have a central light here in the middle that can be used for feedback. And then we have speakers in the room um, that can also be used for feedback. And all of that data and all of this processing is happening at this sort of centralized um, control center where it's reading all the data and, and bringing it and, and giving all this feedback. And, um, and to kind of dive in a little geekier, um, for each person, the technical setup looks like a pair of headphones for individual sound, um, this biopack uh, amplifier for, for using different sensors, um, a sensor to measure galvanic skin response, a temperature, um, you can measure EEG, ECG, EMG, that's uh, muscle, brain, and heart. You can also, also measure res respiration with a strap, and then you have individual light feedback. Um, and this is kind of what the system looks like when it's up and running. And I know this is all a little abstract, like what's going on here, so I have created a video, which you're the first people to see. Um, and I'm going to stand over here because I might narrate some parts of this. So this video is going to walk through like what what does it feel like to be using this system? Okay. And and to um, the flow of the video is what it's going to look like is um, what a typical evening might look like. Okay. It's sort of like um, you can think of it this way. Um, the setup as it is right now 
is we would typically have a meditation teacher who would be working in collaboration with the technology. And the two would be sort of side by side collaborating. Um, and we would put together, let's say in this case, like an hour and a half session. Kind of like a meditation session, except it's worked in with the technology. And there are different experiences that the technology can create. There's really actually hundreds of different experiences the technology can create. And what I'm going to show you now are like five or six different possibilities, okay? How we might run a typical evening. So, so the first thing, the first thing we might do is um, people just, uh, so it's silent because people are wearing headphones. And so this is people just listening to their own heartbeat while, while being given a guided meditation. Um, and then we might switch and people might turn to their neighbor and now they're wearing headphones but now they're hearing and seeing each other's heartbeat while again um, going through a guided meditation. And, and it's kind of hard to tell. It sort of looks like this cheesy techno, you know, digital thing. I don't know what this looks like. But, um, this has been an incredibly powerful experience for people where people have described it, for example, of, um, you know, they take off their headphones and they, and they say, like, wow, you're a person. There's this sense of recognizing another person's humanity, which sometimes we can, without even realizing, objectify other people. Um, and um, the next thing is, you know, we might go around the room where each person <coughs> kind of hear, oh, Oh, we don't have sound. Okay, we don't have sound. So, what's happening is um, we're going around the room, and one at a time, each person's heartbeat is actually um, projected through the central sound system. And it might be their turn for about 30 seconds. And while their heart is being shown in the room and heard in the room, the entire room is practicing a loving kindness meditation towards that person. All right, can you hear this? I wish we had speakers. So we call this the heart symphony. So this is where um, each person's heartbeat is reflected as a different light and a different tone in the space. And then we might switch to breath. I actually don't have video of this, but you can have an individual breath meditation where each person is hearing um, and seeing their own breath. And then this is actually people breaking up into groups of three. You can see like these different colors. And now they're actually hearing each other's breath, and then these lights are a reflection of the summation of each person's breath. So it's a reflection of how synchronized their breath is. And this is one of the most fun parts. I wish you could hear the sound. Um, really hard to hear. It's beautiful. Amazing sound. Uh, you have to trust me. Um, so what this is, is um, this represents each person's breath individually. And this represents the summation of everyone's breath in the room. And here's what's interesting. If you take a group of people and you just sit them down without giving them any instruction except to breathe and watch this glow, the room will come into a naturally emergent, synchronized breath pattern. Not every single person, as you can see, some people are a little out of sync. But the room will, without any instruction, will naturally find um, a breath frequency that is kind of this convergent breath, breath frequency of the group. Um, and people describe it as not just uh, an incredibly sort of relaxing phenomena, but, a set, but as instilling a sense of connection or sort of a, a collective we space in the room where the group is um, with kind of this technology as sort of a catalyst, um, finding this connection point that they didn't have before. Um, so, so, so the, the overview of this, this project is it's, uh, it's an open source platform and it's dedicated to the science of human connection and to developing new interventions that support the human connection. And, of course, the Burning Man uh, experience, which you have to do. 
do. Um, and one of our big um, sort of exciting uh, uh, milestones that we had recently is we actually ran a technology augmented meditation retreat at Esalen, which is a well-known retreat center in the Bay Area. And this was, um, in some ways, a traditional meditation retreat. Um, three days long, led by a really experienced meditation teacher, except the types of activities you just saw were integrated into the meditation experience. And I, as far as I know, nothing like that has ever um, happened almost uh, anywhere, I think. Um, and so, for me, this is just kind of scratching the surface of what I imagine this can become. This is just trying to get a, a footing, trying to get a grasp of um, what are the ways that technology can work to uh, deepen human connection. And once there is that understanding, <clears throat> How can we expand that to a billion people at a time? How can we integrate that into modern social networks? Um, we're starting with 24 people, but um, who knows where we could go. And yeah. thank you everyone.